Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this time we're going to take a look at an early integrated graphics solution from Intel known as the Extreme Graphics 2. We'll go over its history and background before putting it through some Windows 98 retro gaming and benchmarks. Most of you watching today have probably used some sort of Intel graphics in the past, be it on a laptop, desktop or even a Mac. From around 2010 these have been integrated directly into the CPU and most of us wouldn't really give it too much thought. For general desktop productivity it just sits there and does what it does until one day you put in a discrete graphics card and ignore the integrated graphics altogether. But it wasn't always this way. Around 1997, during the later Socket 7 Pentium era, some chipset manufacturers were aiming for the low-end or value PC segment, and would start to introduce all-in-one motherboards. Integrated graphics was a big part of this, and we saw companies like SIS take an early position and re-spin their popular PCI video graphics cards into their integrated motherboard chipsets. In 1998, the market saw Intel release its very first discrete graphics 2D 3D card, the 740. It had some early challenges both in the way it was marketed, the way it was priced, and more importantly, how it performed in real-world gaming. The 740 quickly found its way down to the low-end section of the market, where it would go on to be a strong seller with a significantly lower price. During 1999 and 2000, Intel would create its first IGP on desktop, deriving the core from a mixture of technologies found in the original 740 and the revision, the 752, the latter not getting an actual full retail release. Intel would market this first gen IGP as 3D graphics with direct AGP. The 810 series chipset with its first gen IGP was popular with major OEMs, who would use the highly integrated board to sell high volume, affordable white box computers at a time when internet usage was starting to explode into the mainstream. With a yearly cadence, Intel would release its second generation extreme graphics solution in 2001, firstly for laptop with the 830 chipset. This doubled the Pixel pipelines and provided support for some additional features including DirectX 6 and OpenGL 1.3, but otherwise simply had access to faster system and memory buses that were starting to appear with the later generation Pentium 3 mobile products. 2002 would see the introduction of the integrated graphics for the Pentium 4 desktop, debuting with the 845 series which could utilize DDR memory. 2003 we had the revision, Extreme Graphics 2. This is the one we're looking at today. This came in on the 865 series chipsets for desktop and 850 series for laptop. There was support for faster DDR memory speeds, but other than this, the feature set remained similar to the predecessor. Although it was claimed this second generation could support DirectX 7, this was only in software support, not in hardware unfortunately. After this release, Intel would pivot to the newer GMA line of integrated graphics for generation 3, starting with the GMA 900, which was a significant departure from the extreme line of IGPs. The introduction of GMA would mean no more Windows 9X support for Intel's IGP. For this project, I'm using Intel Reference Board which contains the D865G Springdale chipset. This came out of a scrapped OEM branded small firm factor desktop from a company called Optima. It's got a Prescott based Pentium 4 2.8 GHz CPU featuring 1 MB of cache, an 800 MHz front side bus, and hyperthreading support. Not that Windows 98 will care too much about that, but anyway. I've got two 512MB DDR400 RAM sticks, and this is set up in a dual channel configuration. For storage, I'm using a SATA SSD connected directly to the onboard SATA controller. For simplicity, I have this configured in legacy mode on this motherboard's BIOS. We've got the integrated Extreme Graphics 2, and we also have an AGP expansion slot, which gives us a chance to compare against a few lower end AGP card solutions and see how the integrated graphics holds up. Here's a similar config priced up using an old MSY Australia parts PDF from August 2003. Minus SSD, of course. My collection of cards is a bit thin when it comes to AGP, so choosing a comparison card was a bit of a makeshift affair. First up, I wanted to test a GeForce 4 MX440, which was retailing for under 80 Aussie dollars around 2003, and represented a value and low-end gaming card. Unfortunately, I didn't have one in my inventory, but I had something close, a Quadro 380 XGL, which is based on the MX440 and contains a 128-bit memory bus and is equipped with DDR memory. I figured it would give a fair representation of the MX440 being sold. For the low-end comparison, I was planning to use the cheapest card on this price list. At $44, the TNT2 M64 is listed here, but yeah, nah, that's not going to work. I then had a look at the MX440 SE, which isn't on this list, but despite its name is based on the older GeForce 2. I do have one, but unfortunately it's on my 2 repair shame pile. So as an alternative, I chose the MX400, also based on GeForce 2. By 2003 standards, the MX400 was already past its best before date, but it's a decent choice for Windows 98 gaming, and it's far stronger than the M64. 
With the IGP testing, I'm using an Intel driver 3732 from December 2003. VSync is unfortunately enabled by default for DirectX, but can be turned off for OpenGL using the following settings. A synchronous flip switched on, and flipping policy set to blit. While some DirectX games can disable VSync, for some reason, all the ones that use full screen 582 by 384 resolution, it seemed to be enabled. Using OpenGL, VSync remained disabled for all resolutions. I've also switched the force texture compression on and set the memory footprint to low. That last setting is supposed to give a bit of a performance boost at the cost of a little bit of image quality. The default core clock for the IGP is 266 MHz, but with my motherboard at least, you can enable a 333 MHz mode. It appears this was meant for some sort of burn-in testing mode, but hey, I'll take what I can get at this point. During this testing, I'll show both the stock and overclocked IGP results. The NVIDIA driver choice is a bit simpler. I just used 56.64 for both cards, and I made sure VSync was disabled. Everest reports the GPU codename is Springdale G, with a 266 MHz GPU clock, and a 350 MHz RAM DAC. That didn't seem to change when I enabled the faster mode in the BIOS, but I assure you it's working. It also reports one pixel pipeline, two TMU per pipeline, and one vertex shader. I believe this one to be software support only. The DirectX feature set looks a bit more like a card from the late 90s rather than the 2003 solution, but I guess this is to be expected. We start out with an OpenGL title, Quake 2. It ran well at all resolutions, and that's to be expected, especially if you're playing the single player campaign. If we overclock the IGP, we get 9% boost on average. But we see here the MX400 outpaces the IGP by 28%, and even if you overclock the IGP, this is still 21% slower than the MX400. Incoming was locked to VSync for all resolutions, but I was able to get it to run in 640x480 in 16-bit windowed mode without VSync, so at least we can get a glimpse of what the IGP could theoretically score. At stock, the IGP gets 188.3 frames per second, and this time beats the MX400 by 25%. This extends to 32% if we can overclock. The Quadro is 20% better compared to the overclocked IGP. Unfortunately, with a sample size of 1, this really doesn't tell us much about the resolution scaling. But I guess the good news is, the game runs perfectly on VSync on all resolutions. With Expendable, I had to remove the 512 by 384 runs, as again we had VSync lock with the IGP. For other resolutions, I didn't get this issue. If anyone has some more detail as to why 512 by 384 full screen enables VSync on DirectX, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. It seems like an odd thing to happen. Results here are a bit of a mixed bag. All three graphics chips seem to get CPU bottlenecked at different rates. I reckon all of these can handle 1024 by 768 in either 16 or 32 bit at a stretch. And I'm looking at these results for analysis. The IGP seems to hold on to 32-bit a bit better than the MX400. Again, the Quadro is a clear winner, but that's not a surprise. Trackmania Esports World Cup is a newer game that happens to still run on Windows 98 without any modifications. By 2006, it was a lightweight title for Windows XP, but it can give some older hardware a bit of a challenge. The Intel IGP holds on well during the minimum, faster, and normal settings at 640x480, and it doesn't die completely as we increase the resolution. But I find with Trackmania, every frame counts, so I'd stick to the 640x480 and normal preset for a good experience. The MX400 is in a similar bracket. Yes, it drops off slightly more as we increase the resolution, but otherwise it's a similar experience to the IGP. With Quake 3, the IGP handles this one well, and can do 1024x768 in 16-bit normal preset at a good frame rate. We see the MX400 start out in front with the fastest preset, but then drop behind as we scale up a bit. The Quadro is miles ahead on this one, and it's a reminder of how much things changed between 2001 and 2003 when it came to lower-end gaming options. The 2 Rock 2 demo is mostly CPU limited at this point when it comes to frame rates, but it doesn't matter. We've got solid frame rates all around. I'm only counting the 1024x768 results, as it looks like this is the only one that's not affected by the CPU bottleneck, and we can see a bit of an analysis on the GPUs. I might need to go buy the full version so I can enable a higher detail mode, and maybe that might give some future tests a bit more insight.
Serious Sam's second encounter is a bit heavier, and using the Little Trouble Auto demo, we see the top quality setting is not really usable here. Even the Quadro struggled. Instead you'd need to use a 512x384 mode, which I'm not sure makes a lot of sense with the quality preset. The IGP does score a little stronger than the MX400, but again, not reading too much into that one. Switching to the normal preset, we get a decent result at 640x480 in 16-bit colour, and the IGP continues to hold its own. The Quadro can handle 1024x768 without much trouble here. The speed preset is a bit more realistic for the IGP, and to be honest, I'd probably stick to 512x384 on that speed preset to give the IGP a fighting chance in more complex scenes, particularly if you're using a CRT. But you can push the IGP up to 800x600 in 16-bit mode, and you'll get a similar experience to the MX400. This game is a bit more of an in-depth run of testing, as I saw a big scale of results, and I wanted to see if I could spot new patterns or trends. Not sure I'll do this in the future, as it took a very long time to complete, and then to redo once I figured out I had an inconsistent setting. I ended up recording almost 10 hours of benchmarking so I could keep a record of what I did, and by the end of it, I realised I probably could have just selected a handful of scenarios and be done with it. We call that learning, I guess. After scrolling through my big sheet of results, and quite a few runs of testing to double-check some of the results, I compiled some sort of comparison here. It's by no means comprehensive, and I reckon there's quite a few points up for debate. Unlike new part benchmarking, where there's a bit of exact science we're using latest and greatest, during retro testing it's a bit more of an organic process. There are many more variables, and you have to allow for older software, older aging parts, and sometimes some pretty big compromises. And in my case, nostalgia and memories. First up you'll note the Quadro is not listed. It's because it won every single test easily. No surprises there. So pitching the IGP against the older MX400 and seeing how many times we had to rely on an overclock to eke out a higher frame rate was what I wanted to achieve. Incoming is a faint result. As I mentioned earlier, I could only disable VSync in one mode, and as far as I could take it, the IGP, yeah, it scored higher, but it doesn't really count. If you use full screen, all results are stuck at VSync, and it will all play perfectly fine anyway. Quake 2 was a whitewash to the MX400. We didn't get bad results with the IGP, but the MX400 really pulled away. Expandable was another one with some odd results. I removed the 384p tests, for some reason they were getting VSync enabled as well. I had some strange results where in some cases the 32-bit mode seemed to score higher than the 16-bit mode. I can't really explain it. The MX400 edged out the stock IGP, but lost out if overclocking was enabled. Trackmania pushed all the cards, even the Quadro. The MX400 put up a good fight, but again, overclocking the IGP, it just pulled ahead marginally. Quake 3 was close, but the overclock pushed the win with the IGP. Turok 2 gave me a bit of a headache. In the end, I downscaled to two test results. In the 1024x768 tests, we could see a bit more of a sensible spread. Yes, the IGP takes the points, but again, it's a bit of a negligible difference. Serious Sam's second encounter was a bit more definitive. The stock IGP outpaced the MX400 for the most part. After spending almost a month on and off testing and experimenting with this combo of parts, I've got to a few findings. Number one, there were some outliers, but on a whole, the Extreme Graphics 2 keeps up with the MX400. Number two, I got solid performance with all games tested using 16-bit modes. Number three, overclocking gives a bit more headroom, but it won't push you up the resolution scale. Number four, 80 Aussie dollars got you a big upgrade in 2003. The MX440 was being cleared out, and it seems to be an ideal card for late 98 SE era gaming. It is a stark contrast to the earlier MX440 SE models, which are based on the GeForce 2 and actually sat lower than the MX400 that I've got here for comparison. While the IGP performed well in the tests I ran in this project, keep in mind it is based on older tech and it lacks many hardware features required for later games. The driver is also a bit of a concern. 3D options are limited and if you need to tweak something you're probably going to be out of luck. This being said, most games you're going to play on this setup will work just fine as is. So overall, if you're stuck with the Intel IGP and maybe have a motherboard variant without an AGP expansion slot, you can still play a wide variety of 98 SE games. Yeah, maybe not at the highest resolutions and settings, but you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of this as compared to some of the older integrated graphics solutions I've shown on the channel previously. Did you experience these Intel Extreme graphics? I do wonder if anyone actually used Windows 98 with this back in the day. Most of my memories with this chipset was with Windows XP, and by 2003 I'd well and truly moved on and was mainly working on OEM systems which all came with Windows XP anyway. I'd love to hear your comments and experiences as always. I'm considering doing a follow-up project with this board, maybe with a dual boot of XP and something like a GeForce FX5500 or something, and chuck in a PCI sound card for some DOS gaming action. I've got a few appropriate cases I could use. Let me know if this is the sort of thing you'd be interested in, and I'll put it on the backlog. Anyway, for now, I'll close off this one. Thank you as always for watching, and if you're still here, thanks for sticking it out to the end. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care and bye for now.